All right, so the recording is going and now we will officially get started. So if I click over here in modules, again, we're about week five here. So vehicle inspections, last week we did under hood inspections, but it's not just the stuff under the hood, the stuff underneath the car is equally as important. And so with that, I have um, all kinds of stuff. Of course, if you go to the week five assignment on that tab, what you'll find is Leo Gutierrez again. Now, Leo is one of our adjunct instructors. He is the shop foreman at Roseville BMW, and he takes you through some video clips of doing a vehicle inspection at BMW, which would be similar to if you worked at CarMax or any dealership, like their used car inspection. That's what, of course, he's going to take you through. And um, if you're doing your worksheet, which is, where is it? Right here, bumper to bumper inspections guideline and inspection sheet fillable form, you can complete your worksheet based off his inspection. But honestly, guys, this is a lot more fun if um, you, know, you have access to your own car. Now the underhood inspection you know, I figure if you have access to your own car, that's pretty easy to do. I totally understand that a lot of you guys are not going to have access to get underneath your car. And quite frankly, when you're doing this at home, you got to really pay attention to a lot of stuff to get underneath the car and get underneath there safely. Okay, so um, for this, you might use our video clips. We also have some other under vehicle inspection uh, um video clips and, and some notes here on brake pads. So all kinds of good stuff under this assignment. Just like always, there's a little uh, uh, qu quiz that follows up with this. That's only a, um, a few questions here. So pretty straightforward, kind of matches the other weeks. I'll go back to the modules tab because remember my goal is always to give you, you know, a little bit different perspective than what's just loaded in um, in Canvas for you, right? To give you the maximum amount of resources. Speaking about resources, like last week, I gave you some great links from Gates on how to check belts and how to do a car inspection. This week, we have some great stuff on testing your shocks and struts. So here's a video clip link of that. Shocks and struts do far more than just give you a comfortable ride. And that's related to under car inspection. And you can do a lot of your, um, you know, inspection on the shocks and struts by without even lifting up the car. If you shake the car, give it a good old jounce test. Um, let me see if I can cue it up to where he's pushing on it. Um, also, if you look at the tires. Caused by the shock or strut. Uh, you can tell if you have worn shocks or struts without having to get underneath the car. So um, anyways, I have some great resources. I hope you guys take advantage of those. This is one of those classes where, you know, you'll have you have access to more information than maybe you could possibly deal with all in one semester. But that's kind of the point is to give you guys the tools if you're look, you know, that you're looking for to move forward. Another pretty popular thing, even for do it yourselfers is um, the CV axles. Now CV stands for constant velocity. So I loaded a couple of video clips on that for you as well. Okay, and uh, Jacob, I see your note here on the safety certification sheet. Um, I'm assuming Jacob, and I just wanna ask you guys, your, your question is about the SP2 safety test. Is that correct? And you could call out or you could respond on the chat. Okay, there we go. Yes. All right. So I'll tell you what, at the end of the night, Jacob, let's, um, let's come back to this and see if we can troubleshoot as to what's going on with your SP2 safety test. Okay. Very good. Don't let me forget about it. All right. Um, so I just wanted to point out for you guys, some of the resources here related to under vehicle inspections. Um, let me go back to back to modules. And um, so, so this is kind of where, where we're at. Let's jump in to tonight's um, presentation. 
and then we'll kind of circle back to uh, you know, how can we get our car up in the air at home? What's the safest way to do so? Um, and so with that, I'm going to change my screen share to my presentation. There we go. Okay, so now let's do this one more time and make it fill the page a little bit better for you guys. Okay. Um, and this is an older vehicle, but I would say oftentimes when you when you pop the hood on a vehicle that was out of warranty, um, that the customer just was driving and driving and driving, you know, this is kind of how stuff would often look, especially in the day and age that of cars I was working on in the 90s and early 2000s. This vehicle here is... Uh, early 90s you can see back when i took this picture you know that was a long time ago now um but you know all kinds of typical stuff that you would see so i know we're doing under car inspections but i just wanted to point out you know some basic stuff like this is a real common one batteries held in with the bungee cord that's a classic and obviously this owner did their own battery they even got the little felt pad, you know, that that's stuck to the side of the battery. It's not held in properly. Um, the covers aren't all the way, the terminals aren't all the way covered. Believe it or not, when the battery is not secure, not only is it not safe if you got in an accident or something, but it allows the battery to um, move around under vibration and that can actually make the battery, it exposes it to more vibration and that could shorten the lifespan of the battery. Okay, a couple other things uh, to note here um, that uh, there's, you know, there's some wetness there on the valve cover. So this thing could use a new valve cover gasket for, for replacement. So that'd be a nice little service job. I think I pointed this out before, but that's got the factory hose clamps on that hose. That's probably the original upper radiator hose. Uh, so that could be a recommend replacement. Um, what do you guys notice on this slide here that looks looks new? Looks like it's been recently replaced. What do you guys think? All right, I know it's kind of hard to see. I cheat because I, I know what. So look at this right here. The distributor is new and the in the uh, spark plug wires and stuff. This was recently replaced. And why is that important? <clears throat> well, oftentimes I would get a customer, they bring their car in and they'd be like, oh, it doesn't run right. Or maybe it comes in <clears throat> on the tow truck and it's a no start. And you try to get information for your customer. And I don't, I don't know why this is, <clears throat> but oftentimes I experience that people wouldn't want to tell you everything. It's almost like they thought, well, hey, if I don't tell him, it'll be cheaper or something. I don't know. I, I don't tell him and he'll just fix it. Um, <clears throat> anyways, that kind of puts you behind the eight ball because then you're, you know, you, any information you can get from your customer. And for that, for that matter, if you're the customer, bring your, any information you can share with them, like, oh, it only does the problem on a cold startup or a warm startup or a, that will help them figure out the issue. So I always looked for stuff like this because I thought, oh, OK, well, if this car came in and it's a no start, I'm going to go right here right away because maybe they didn't put that distributor in correctly. Maybe it's out of time. Maybe they messed something else up. Who knows? But I'm always suspect of new parts. All right, let's clear those drawings and keep this thing moving. All right, so if we go under the vehicle, um, you know, there's all kinds of major components underneath there. Here we're looking at the transmission on a vehicle. This is an automatic transmission. And I can tell that <clears throat> because it's got this nice big transmission pan here where a manual transmission wouldn't have a big pan like that. Um, so this is an automatic transmission. You can see the shift linkage. So when you go from park, reverse, drive neutral, you're moving a cable right here that goes down to this lever. So that's the shift linkage. This is a fairly late model 
meaning new, newer vehicle, I would say it's, you know, made in the last 20 years or so. And what that means is that this is a computer controlled transmission. So here's the vehicle speed sensor. This is the Pringle switch or it lets the computer know what gear it's in. I notice that here's a wire going over to the oxygen sensor on the exhaust, okay? And this bar that connects underneath the transmission, that's called the, the cross member. It goes from one frame rail to another. This is a pickup truck. And then I'll point out one other thing that I can see right here. This gold looking thing, that's your fuel filter. So fuel gets pumped from the gas tank in the back of the vehicle through a fuel line, through that filter, then it continues up to the engine. So that there's that fuel filter. That's a nice item to service. You know, it could be, uh, you know, look at your maintenance guide. It might, it might be changing every 30,000 miles or every 60,000 miles. There are some cars where they've buried this filter now in the gas tank. So basically you replace it when the fuel pump uh, craps out, but um, you know, that's something good to change, especially if you have a car that lacks power on acceleration. Um, I've seen that a lot. I've seen it where somebody goes and they, they, they're getting, getting gas um, when the truck is filling up the gas tanks in at the station and that's stirring up all the crud in the bottom of the tanks at the gas station. So you're more likely to clog a fuel sock and a fuel filter when you're filling up at those times. Um, all right. So there's a lot of stuff that you can see when you get under the vehicle. All right, we'll clear out those drawings and keep going. So this is that, uh, no, this is a different pickup truck. That's right. This is another pickup truck, but again, it's an automatic transmission. Most pickup trucks these days are, most cars for that matter. So here's that transmission pan. You can see some of that, that linkage, but this is a four wheel drive pickup truck. So what that means is, is it's got a transfer case that sits back here and when you put it in four wheel drive, you're engaging this forward drive shaft so that it can also provide power to the front front wheels there. Um, so that's just kind of another shot. Well, what that means is if you got a car that's four wheel drive, there's more parts and pieces on that car. And that means there's more stuff to wear out and break and have to be fixed. So here we have a universal joint right there and slip yoke there. And so there's just, there's extra pieces on this thing that will need to be serviced. You know, it, it, one way to look at cars or anything mechanical for that matter, the more parts and pieces you have on there, the more stuff that's eventually gonna break down that you'll have to deal with. All right. So here's a shot, uh, same vehicle. Here is that transfer case. So we just moved the camera a little bit further back and uh, what, what this transfer case thing does is to get is here's the transmission, right? So that the engine is over here. So I'll put engine T, here's the transmission. And the power comes from the engine through the transmission and normally would go out this rear drive shaft to the rear wheels. But when you engage four wheel drive, you're engaging this transfer case and it's got a chain in here and you put it in four wheel drive and then it sends power also to the front drive shaft. So again, more parts and pieces. Of course, if you're stuck in the mud or snow, like you don't care if there's more parts and pieces, you just wanna get unstuck, right? So four wheel drive in slippery conditions is a huge advantage. Um, so one thing I notice, and we'll see this again on some of the other pictures, is that there is some oil seepage from the rear of the transfer case, all right? And I'll clear this out of here. One other little thing to point out is here is another oxygen sensor. This one happens to be behind the catalytic converter for cat monitoring. So this vehicle, I believe had three or four oxygen sensors on it. Okay, moving right. Along. Here's another shot of that thing. So you can see the seepage. You can see here's the speedometer cable coming out. There's that O2 sensor. You can see the rear uh, like transmission mount down here. Um, and how stuff's kind of now this isn't a huge leak. 
it's, uh, you know, just kind of a seepage. So I don't know if I would be really super concerned about it. But if I was doing an under vehicle inspection, I would certainly note that down on my repair order that there was seepage there and it's something to keep an eye on. Okay. Um, now, while I got you guys here, I want to point out a couple of plugs on this because for all, um, I'm going to put here manual transmissions, differentials, For all these types of things, manual transmissions, right? Where you have to shift the gear differentials and transfer cases, they're a little different. They don't have a dipstick. What they have in them, of course, is fluid to keep stuff lubricated. It's usually some type of heavy duty gear oil. And the fluid is designed so that when the vehicle's sitting there and the fluid is, is warmed up, remember as stuff heats up, it expands a little bit. So you drive it around the block a little bit the fluid level, it heats up and expands, and it should be right to the bottom of this top plug, okay? This top plug here, this guy right here, this is the fill hole, okay? And this one down here, this is, this is the drain. So if I wanted to change the transfer case fluid, I would open up the drain, I'd let the fluid pour out, put this plug back in there, and I would fill it up. Now with, with the transmission or the, 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 the gear oil uh, cold, I would fill it up to maybe like oh, about three eighths of an inch, just a little bit below the fill plug with the idea that as the fluid heats up, it expands and it'll be right at the base of the fill plug. A lot of times if you've driven the ca car around and you take this plug out of there, the fluid will just barely leak out a little bit. If you've driven it around and you take that fill plug out to check the fluid level and it doesn't spill out and you take your finger and you stick it in there and kind of feel around it. If you have to put your finger way down in there before you feel fluid, it's definitely low on fluid, okay? So that's how you would check the differential fluid. The, this is a transfer case, how you would check its fluid level or even a manual transmission. There's gonna be a drain plug and there's gonna be a fill plug on most all of these and so you got to get that fluid level to the fill plug when it's when the fluids uh, warmed up or it should be just below just a smidge below that fill plug when the fluid is cold okay all right moving right along so uh here is um uh another picture this is a, a different vehicle. It's, it's one we looked at earlier though. Um, uh, and here is the rear differential. There's the rear drive shaft. This one is not four wheel drive. And uh, what I do want to point out is I, I did lie to you a little bit just a minute ago. Remember I said there's a fill plug and there's a drain plug. This particular vehicle, this is Chevy here or GMC. Um, he doesn't have he doesn't have a drain plug. Sometimes there's a little plug right here in this cover, but th these guys typically don't have a drain plug. If you want to drain the fluid out, what you got to do is take all these bolts out of here and pop that cover off to drain the fluid and then replace the gasket and put it back together. It does have a fill plug. It's on the front side, um, just like on the other side of this axle tube. So a little different setup. So no drain plug on that one but still has the fill plug works the same way. Um, of course, you're looking for any signs of leaks or anything, any play in the, in the universal joints. A um, little bit there, there's a water seepage hole in the, in the muffler. So that's pretty normal. A lot of times I'll, you know, just kind of poke at it with a screwdriver to see if the muffler's starting to crumble and get eaten up and needs to be replaced. Um, but that's all this, this vehicle is pretty clean on, on the back side looks pretty normal. Um, but while we're here, I always like to point out different components of the vehicle, right? And um, in this case, I wanna point out, this thing is up on a two post lift. Why do we call it two post? Well, because these yellow arms will go like this and that. And then 
we need, it has two posts coming out of the ground that the arms attach to and that's how it lifts the vehicle up and down. And what you'll notice is that these lift pads go right underneath the frame rails. This is a pickup truck. So it has a frame underneath it where a car typically is unibody construction. So it has no frame. It's like the fenders and all the sheet metal of the car kind of forms that structure. So, and that's strong enough where it doesn't need a frame because a pickup truck you know, has to tow heavy loads and carry stuff in the back. A pickup truck generally will have a solid steel frame that runs the length of the vehicle. And that's, and then you could like, you could like unbolt the bed from the frame and take it off of there. And you'll see people do that. Maybe they'll put on like some type of special bed with toolboxes and stuff. Um, there's uh, some vehicles, like if you work on newer Ford trucks, you want to do something on the engine you, you can't get to the darn engine on those new Fords. So what you have to do is actually unbolt the cab of the truck where the driver and passenger sit. You unbolt that and you lift that off of the frame so that you can get to the engine. It's craziness. Um, so you can see the frame there. This is the uh, rear differential, right? Coil springs on this. If I can highlight that, there's coil spring. Um, I'll make this green. This thing that's right here, that's made of black plastic with a little sheet metal cover, guess what? That is the gas tank. Um, so it's just sitting right there, you know, I mean, people, I remember a few years ago, uh, they were making a big deal about the Tesla that caught on fire, right? Most all of our cars just have like a plastic gas tank hanging down on the bottom, like, you know, it's, it's not super protected. I guess it's protected enough because it's inside the frame rail, but that's the gas tank. And then uh, let's see, I'll change colors. I'll go with the pink. This bar that you see right here, that's going from one end of the suspension to the other, that is your rear sway bar on this vehicle. All right, so all kinds of stuff you can, you can see up here. It's got independent front suspension. Both of these pivot independently, but it has a solid rear axle. So here's another shot of a differential. This again, this is a, a, a different vehicle. Um, the one that I showed you a minute ago that didn't have the, the drain on it, um, you know, they'll have like a fill plug like right here on those. Here we can see the shock absorber. Look at that. That's the spare tire right there when you got the car in the shop. Always check that spare tire, make sure it has air in it. So if the customer does get a flat, they're not just stranded. Now I will say that if, you know, like my wife, she's she's pretty sharp and she knows how to change a tire, but there's no way that she is going to be able to heave a big heavy truck tire from underneath the side of the truck. Uh, and our truck even has kind of like a cable lift thing it's still so big and heavy. It's very hard for her physically to change that tire. So she's, you know, that's why I have roadside assistance and she's probably going to get some help doing that. Um, that's a pretty common spot though, where they'll store the spare tire is underneath the bed of the truck. So just keep, keep that in mind. Like that tire is not light. And if you had to change it, it's not the easiest thing to do. Um, this vehicle has drum brakes in the back. And then I always like to point out all the computer sensors and stuff. This is an older vehicle, but it's got at least rear wheel anti-lock brakes. And that is the rear uh, uh, wheel speed sensor right there. Kind of, you can see the wiring right behind the word where it says differential. Here's a brake line right there. So all kinds of stuff to check. There's that gas tank. All right, let's clear those out of there and keep going. So here's a U joint, it's short for universal joint. And the idea is if I go back, you know, that these, um, the rear suspension is gonna move up and down as I go over bumps, right? And of course this thing's transmitting the power from the engine and transmission to the rear differential. So he's gonna be moving up and down. 
And what that means is that the angle of this has to change based on what's going on with the suspension, right? As it moves up and down. So the universal joint allows this thing to pivot as we change angles and go up and down over bumps and stuff. And if I clear out my drawings and we go forward, you know, um, this is a factory one. There's no grease fittings on here. Aftermarket ones oftentimes will have a little fitting right here that you could squirt some grease in there. Um, what will happen over time is you'll get some play in here and it will go clunk, 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 especially if you're going forward and reverse um, as one piece will slip in the other part. So I always check that. Um, I always put a wrench on these bolts and make sure that they're nice and tight. Uh, and it's something we do, even like before I put a car in the dyno, I check the universal joint bolts uh, to make sure that the drive shaft's not gonna come off of there. Every once in a while, you might be driving around, you see a car stuck on the side of the road and this drive shaft is laying on the ground because these bolts broke or this guy broke and I see it happen at the racetrack. And I'll tell you, if this thing comes off of there at 60 miles an hour, it beats the crud out of the underside of your vehicle. I've seen it break transmission housings and just cause all kinds of damage. So I always inspect the U-joints, inspect these bolts very carefully when I'm underneath the car. All right. So we've been looking at some rear wheel drive pickup trucks and four wheel drive stuff. But, you know, when we go to passenger cars and all these little kind of like, um, not full size SUVs, but smaller SUVs or crossovers, they call them these days. Most all this stuff, even Subarus that are all wheel drive, they're still pretty much a front engine, front wheel drive layout. And so a lot of stuff you will see is this kind of um, general configuration where you have the engine and transmission and stuff all in the front of the vehicle. Now, a couple of things we can see here. Here's our exhaust system. It's got a, a flex pipe here because the engine has to rock back and forth as it works. Or earlier I pointed out a, a rear sway bar. Here is the front sway bar on this vehicle and you can see it scraped bottom a little bit there. It's not too big of a deal. Lower control arms. Here is the oil pan and there's the drain plug. So if we were gonna do an oil change, it's right there. And then this pan that you can see is seeping some fluid. That is the automatic transmission, or in this case, it's a transaxle because it combines the differential and the transmission all into one unit. Um, so there's the transaxle. And then what he has, and it's hard to see, but he has a drive shaft that comes out and it goes to this front wheel. And he's got a drive shaft kind of behind here that goes to this front wheel. So he has two drive shafts, one on each side. And we call those because one goes half one way and the other one goes half the other way. A lot of times we'll call those half shafts. And each one of these half shafts has a CV or constant velocity joint on each end uh, instead of a U joint. And so those are things we'll inspect as we move more towards the front of the vehicle. All right, let's clear those drawings out of there. So I'm a little concerned with that transmission uh, transmission seepage. You can see people have scraped bottom and how kind of exposed the exhaust system is. Here's a front uh, tow hook right here. Lower control arms. I always look at the bushings and stuff. If you, um, let's say you were leaking a ton of oil you know, if this thing gets all oily, oil will soak into these rubber bushings and it will eat away the rubber. And then your alignment starts getting out of whack and you might be eating up tires. So, you know, we do want to try to take care of those oil leaks because they will eat up the rubber components underneath the car. Besides make a mess on our driveway and stuff. All right, here we're zoomed in on a little bit of that. You can see that inner CV a little bit better that transmission seepage. All right, and then here's a better shot of it. I think we, no, we didn't switch cars, the same car. 
Um, so when we look at this, it must be this. This must have been a, a minivan or something. Um, I thought it was something else, but now that I look at it again, I'm trying to remember which car this was. Uh, what I'm paying attention to is see how there's all these lines. There's coolant and air conditioning lines going to the back, so it's got to have air conditioning and heating in the back, which means it's got to be a van. Um, so here is that half shaft, okay? And then each one of these guys here, this is the inner inboard CV or constant velocity joint. Here's the outboard CV or constant velocity joint. And the reason we use this type of joint instead of a U joint is because we have front wheels and they got to also steer the car. So they got to be able to turn at much sharper angles on top of going over the bumps. So I need a more flexible joint in that uh, spot. So whenever I get the car up, or even if I just took the wheel off and I poked my head in there, I check this boot here and make sure it's not cracked. Here's what commonly happens on these, is that over time, the rubber gets old and it starts to crack and fail in these grooves. And at some point, this thing breaks. And then once it breaks, he throws out all the special grease that's in the joint and it makes a big mess all over the place. Once this CV joint uses it, loses its special extreme pressure grease, um, it quickly fails in that uh, dirt and, and debris can now get in the joint because it wants to stick to all the grease. It loses its lubrication and it, and it basically just gets all worn out. And I've actually seen these. I had a car where, you, you know, it came in on the hook and people thought there was something wrong with the transmission. You went to put it in driver reverse and it didn't go anywhere. And what it acted like is like when you got one tire in the mud and it's just spinning. Well, the CV joint, the boot broke and they kept driving it. And they kept driving it and it threw out all the grease and they just kept driving it, driving it. Over, over time, what will happen is it will start making a clicking noise, especially when you're going through the turns. It'll start going click, 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 click as you turn. But these people, they just kept driving it and to the point where this, this joint got so old and crusty, it just broke on the inside. And so the inside part of the axle was spinning, but the wheel that was connected to this part was not spinning so the car wouldn't go anywhere. And so what we had to do is replace the CV axle. Okay? And if one's bad, the other one's probably not too far behind. So I think we did both CVs on that. The customer was happy though, because they thought they needed a new transmission. Um, so that's a pretty, you know, pretty common thing, especially on front wheel drive cars. Now, do any of you guys have or maybe want to have or your friends have a car that's lowered? You got that thing slammed to the ground. It's lowered way down. Looking cool. Does anybody have one of those? It generally makes the car corner better. Um, and we, of course, we lower all of our race cars to get the, the center of gravity as low as possible. But what happens is is if you lower the car guys is that now the rear suspension is moved up because I've lowered the car. So with that, now the CV is always kind of working at extreme angles all the time because the wheels got to be level. So this one's more at an angle, that one's more at an angle. So if your car is lowered or if it's a pickup truck and it's raised way up, you'll burn through your CV joints faster uh, because you're always operating at them at a more extreme angle, okay? So something to think about right there. Um, so I always check those. I have one more thing to point out here is you see those little teeth right there? This vehicle again has anti-lock brakes and that is the ABS wheel speed sensor. Okay, and a couple other things, suspension related. Here is your lower ball joint. This one, you could take off those three bolts, hammer that out, and you could, you could change that lower ball joint. This vehicle also has strut suspension. So this is my front strut right there. 
you can kind of see the back side of the brake assembly. So again, there's always lots of stuff that you can see when you're underneath the car. Now, you might go, well, what's going on over here? We were doing um, belts and something. And, and anyways, we were working on the engine. And so we had these covers off and the serpentine belt is off of here. And we were doing some engine work. Um, and I just grabbed these photos because it was up in the air and it was convenient. Okay, let me check the chat. Uh, oh, uh, you're so low that shops don't want to touch your car. Yeah, I'll tell you what, from being a mechanic, uh, you know, as, as a tech, you're getting out of like, in and out like 100 cars a day, right? Like you're constantly getting in a car, getting out of a car, getting in a car, getting out of a car. Um, when you have a car that's really, really low, or a pickup truck that you got to climb in, you're like, oh, good gracious. Like, it's the last thing I want to do is have to get on the ground or climb in something. Um, over time, you're like, I just want something that's stock, that's easy to get into, that doesn't have some crazy wheels on it uh, as you work on stuff. It's really funny how your tastes change. But yeah, if the car is really low, like it may not fit on the lifts, it, it gets to be a real pain uh, in the neck, you know, and so that's, that's one of the compromises, right? Like, um, if your car is really low, shops might not want to work on it, or they might charge you more money to work on it. And if you're that person who's working on cars every day, you'll quickly understand why you don't like working on those cars that are too high or too low or too customized. Uh, Cause sometimes it's just, it's more trouble than it's worth. So um, but if you specialize in those types of cars, you might have just a, a good group of clientele that's always coming to your establishment, right? So that could be your niche in the market. So, all right. Yeah, usually at the alignment shop is where you're going to get blown out. And that's because, our, you know, unless we have a, an in-ground alignment rack, the alignment rack is this big platform that's sitting above the ground. And then we have ramps in front of it but your car still has to be, you know, tall enough so that I can get, you know, get it up and, and drive it up on the ramps and it doesn't scrape bottom and stuff. And so um, like at the college, we wanted to put this rack flush mount and like sink it into the ground a couple feet and it turned into a big problem and they weren't, they didn't want to do it. And so what we have to do is we have to have like, you know, five extra ramps to kind of put this way out so we can make the angle of attack shallow enough that we can get a car up on there. And it is, it's a huge pain in the neck. Um, that's what you gotta do. We're in the process of building a new shop. We're going through all the design stuff and a couple of our alignment racks will be flush mounted. They'll be set in the ground specifically for doing lowered cars. And so I'm really, really excited about that. The plans for the new shop are, are coming out nice. The new shop's actually going to be a little bit smaller than our existing shop, but it's going to be much better organized and it's going to be state of the art. So it's it, it'll be super cool. Um, so that's coming in a few years. Um, all right. So uh, now we're looking at another uh, another vehicle. This is kind of an interesting one because usually you don't see like uh, rack and pinion power steering on a truck, but this is kind of a, a lighter, it's not a super heavy duty truck. So it does have rack and pinion power steering. So um, let's check out what we got here. So it's got independent front suspension. There's the lower control arms, coil springs, and then the shock absorbers are these guys in the middle here. And when I look at this stuff, I'm looking for signs of wetness. If this guy is all wet in here, that's a sign that the shock is leaking oil in there and it needs to be replaced. Here is my rack and pinion steering, okay? And a lot of new cars, the power assist of the steering is electric, but on older cars, and this one right here, you can see it's got a couple of lines because it uses a power steering pump and power steering fluid. And so this could be another leak point also, these boots, kind of like the CV boots, these could crack or tear. And so that was something that I always looked for. That could be a nice little job to, 
to fix on the customer's car. And, and of course, if you go too long with these boots being blown, a bunch of dirt and junk will get inside your rack and wear out your rack and a new rack of pinion is going to be several hundred dollars, right? It could be five, $600 for a new rack. So I'd rather change a $20 boot and realign the car than a $500 rack. So um, you can see the rear drive shaft, the solid rear axle, the back shock absorbers in the back. Um, here is, I can highlight it, the front sway bar and where it connects to the uh, lower control arms there. And then these um, rods coming out of the rack there and there go to your steering arms. Those are your, those are your uh, tie rods. And that's, that's how you steer your vehicle. It, it basically moves the, the, the steering arms back and forth and uh, turns those front tires. And then this rack will move, slides back and forth as you do your steering, so. Um, this this car is pretty clean and tidy looking underneath here on the front, looking pretty pretty nice uh, for a older car. There's a rear shock absorber. We've been looking at this car before. You can see another. There's a spare tire again. Um, so again, if this thing was all oily, see it's it's dirty but it's dry looking. If it was oily, that indicates that the oil that's inside the shock is leaking out of the shock and it's time to replace that sucker. So, you know, if, if you ever watch Top Gear or um, I don't know, you you either spent time in other countries, a lot of times they, in other countries, they don't call it a shock. They call it a shock absorber. They call it a damper. And I like that term better because that's what it does. The shock absorbers dampen the oscillations of the springs and they do that by running a piston on the inside there's a piston in here plunging back and forth through oil so if it leaks out the oil it's not going to have the dampening effect that it should have now the wheels kind of bouncing as it goes down the road you're losing grip losing traction your braking uh distances increase um so it's all it's all bad news um, one of our instructors, uh, Jennifer Andronis, I remember years ago, she got to do, she was the manager of a Firestone at one point, and she got to do a really cool class that they, they went out, it was like from Monroe struts and shocks, and they, they bought like five used cars off of used crappy car lots, right? Just to your typical, you know, five to, you know, $10,000 used cars. And they drove those cars around a little test track and felt the car and wrote down their findings and how the car felt. Then they took all these cars, they threw new shocks on them, new struts, so some cars use struts instead of shocks, but they, they replaced those components, drove them around again, and she said it was amazing the difference. One of the tests they did is they had a, a braking drill where you went up and you slammed on the brakes at a certain point, and there was like a couple of bumps in the in the road where, where you were hitting the, hitting the brakes, and they all stopped significantly shorter, like in the neighborhood of you know, 10 to like 25 feet shorter by having good shocks on the car. So I can tell you from racing, the shocks and how they're tuned and set up make a big difference how the car goes around the track too. All right, a couple of things in this picture that are things I'm always looking at. Um, this thing right here, this is your rear brake line. It comes there, it's a flexible line and then it's a hard line out to each wheel. This has rear leaf springs, this particular vehicle. And it's kind of hard to see, but it also has a little line up here that's a vent for the differential. So, um, you know, maybe you're looking at buying a car that's a flood car, or, or maybe you got a guy who, who he has a boat and he's constantly backing his truck in the water to launch his boat. If water gets up, to this level and it gets into this little vent, it'll contaminate the differential fluid in there. Um, and then that will cause that thing to burn out. So, um, you know, if you have something that's been sunk in the water, you're changing all the fluids, these, the transmission, the differential, these do need a vent on them. And so the, they try to rent the route, the vent as high as they can, but if you really got it dunked in the water, 
and you would get water inside those components. So, all right, moving right along. So now we have uh, the same vehicle we looked at before that we were doing the belts and stuff on, but now we're looking at the brakes and this is a better image of the front strut. Now you might be thinking, well, what the heck's the difference between a shock and a strut? Well, they kind of both do the same job. They're, they both provide dampening for the springs, right? So they're both dampers. However, the strut basically is multiple things. The strut on the inside has the shock absorber right here, but it also has this body here that bolts to the steering and suspension and the coil spring comes into it here. And so essentially what the strut does is it, it, it's kind of a combination. It, it becomes your upper control arm, your, it holds your spring. And so it kind of combines multiple things with a, a spring attachment point and your upper control arm. And uh, when we first started putting engines in the front of our cars, that's when uh, we started using a lot of struts because it allowed more room in the front of the car in between the, the suspension points. Um, so struts are really, really common. Again, a lot of the same stuff still applies. I'm looking for any signs of wetness or if this boot is blown, something like that in there to see it is the is the strut okay or does it need to be replaced when they really start leaking out the fluid you'll see fluid oozing out of that little hole right there um so you know that's that's you know a way to check those strut assemblies we can also see from this image here is our brake pads here they look like they got pretty good meat on them um here is the front caliper assembly and then you can see where our, our half shaft comes in there. It's a vented front brake rotor. Um, this is a, a, a floating caliper design. And uh, yeah, that's pretty, maybe we'll get some of this stuff out of the way. Yep, there is my bleeder screw right there if I need to bleed the brakes. And while I got you guys here, what you can see is that the backing plate on these brake pads happens to be painted red, right? And I'm trying to outline it. And then you can see kind of dirty in front of that is here is the friction material that goes up against the rotor. And it's got a little divot out there. Um, so you can see the outboard pad from looking on the outside. The brake calipers, they always give us a little window here so we can look in and see the, the inside um, pad thickness, right? And my rule is this, is if the backing plate, oh, here's my backing plate, it should be straight. If the friction material is thicker than the backing plate, hey, that's good, okay? But if the friction material is the same thickness as the backing plate or less, I need to start thinking about changing those brake pads because that last little bit of brake material goes pretty quickly. And, uh, you know, once you go metal on metal, now you're buying rotors, maybe you're having to put on a new caliper and the cost of your brake repair job goes up dramatically. Also, you know, it's a safety thing, right? So I rather change my pads a little bit more often than not. So if the friction material here is the same thickness or thinner than the backing plate, it's time to change those pads. Okay, That's a good way to err on the side of safety and keep up on brake pad changes so you won't be caught by surprise. And I got to change some pads on one of my cars here real soon. All right. There are some cars out there that have air suspension in them from the factory, some Lincoln Continentals and stuff. And you had to be really careful with those when you worked on them and lifted them because the idea is that they, they had this auto air leveling suspension. And so if you got on like one corner of the car and started jacking up the, the uh, rear of the car with a floor jack, the rear suspension would freak out. I actually worked with the guy 
that did just that. And before I realized what he was doing, um, you know, the air, the air pump saw the car was unlevel. It kept pumping air in this thing to try to level out the car and ended up blowing out this air suspension bag. Sometimes you'll see some of these cars going down the road and it's, you know, it's your classic scraper. Here's, here's the car. And you think, well, the front looks fine, but the back's dragging on the ground. What's going on? Well, it's the rear air suspension bags are all blown out. Um, anyways, so that's something I look out for. It was pretty popular on some of your luxury cars, Lincolns and, and uh, Mercury's and some, uh, you know, Cadillacs and stuff. Uh, and over time, these bags would always fail. So grab the picture of that just so you guys are aware of it. We'll clear up those drawings. We'll keep going. Here's a coil spring. Uh, we've looked at this, this truck before. Um, solid rear axle. Leaf springs. So what's the difference here between these two images? This is like a half ton pickup truck. That's a three quarter ton or a one ton. Um, coil springs will give you a better ride quality. They usually can't support as much weight. Leaf springs, uh, they're not as refined but they're stronger and they can support more weight. Okay, so that's the difference between the two. This guy's getting pretty rusty, pretty old and tired. I can see a blown out sway bar bushing here. It's got aftermarket rear shocks, um, pretty messy and dirty. There's probably like a, a differential rear seal leak. Um, anyways, that's pretty common. Now we have seen some images of the exhaust system in some of our slides. Like here's the muffler and the tailpipe. I wanted to put up this graphic here uh, just to show you guys. Um, you know, a modern car can have a pretty expensive exhaust system from the factory. Now, the smog laws say that, you know, we can change the exhaust after the catalytic converter, okay? We could put on a different muffler. I mean, heck, I can even just eliminate this thing and I could make it straight pipe if I wanted to it'd be pretty screaming loud and I might get, you know, fix it tickets from getting pulled over by the cops. But, you know, I can modify the exhaust after the cat, as long as my modifications are safe and they meet noise ordinance ordinances. Um, so maybe I, you know, I'm single, I can make it a dual exhaust if I wanted to. Again, the smog laws say, hey, I can do what I want after the cat, okay? So, Obviously, this cat thing has to deal with emissions. In fact, it does a lot. In fact, the catalytic converter, you can see how it's one of the hottest things on the exhaust. Its job is to get real hot and it burns any emissions the engine doesn't burn on its own. So if the engine, you know, is running a little rich, it's got some hydrocarbons, some CO, the cat's going to try to burn those things up, okay? Well, normally, if your engine is running right, it's not making a ton of emissions. So the cat's just having to burn a little bit of stuff. It's just it's just kind of catching the scraps, right? The stuff that the engine didn't burn on its own, the cat's going to burn those up and clean up the exhaust, okay? But let's say you get a car that's now running poorly. Maybe you've gone too long in between changing spark plugs and you have a misfire. Or uh, maybe you have dirty fuel injectors or a malfunctioning oxygen sensor. And so now the engine's making a lot more emissions, a lot more smog, HC, CO, NOx. Well, all that's going to be pumped down the exhaust system. And you know what the cat's going to try to do? He's going to try his darndest to burn up those emissions. And usually what happens over time is it ends up burning up the cat. So it's pretty common to have an engine drivability issue, meaning that the engine is not driving like it should. It's got a misfire. It's got something wrong with it. So the engine is running poorly. And then the catalytic converter takes the abuse from there. Maybe the engine starts running so bad that finally the person fixes that engine issue. And they think, hey, everything's good. But then they go in for a smog check. And guess what? They fail emissions or the check engine lights on because now the catalytic converter has been damaged 
by the engine running poorly, okay? So that cat's in there, he takes the brunt of that exhaust uh, emissions and uh, anything that makes the engine run poorly is certainly gonna start burning up that cat. So keep that in mind. Um, even so much if, if you're always racing your car around, um, you know, when you're wide open throttle, it's running a richer mixture. And if you're driving all the time like that, that in itself will burn up the cat. And we see that on some of our track cars and stuff where we have a, uh, somebody who goes out to the racetrack quite a bit over time, it does end up wearing out their cat uh, prematurely. So, all right. So I wanted to put that graphic up. Last thing I want to say is if you have, let's say you have a late model like 2010, 12, 15 or newer truck that's diesel, it's got a crazy exhaust system with a huge cat and SCR injection and all kinds of fancy stuff is in the exhaust system of these newer trucks to get those diesel engines to run cleaner. And what people don't realize is that's like a, a $10,000 exhaust system if you if you had to change it. Um, so anyways, uh, people will like reprogram their diesels and now the thing's running, it's running faster, but it's making a lot more emissions. And you know what it does? It wipes out that um, exhaust system and those things are pricey. Uh, cats, by the way, what makes them work on the inside is precious metals. There's platinum, palladium, rhodium. So these things are valuable and that's why the nasty cat thieves will go around and steal people's catalytic converters off their cars, um, even though they're, they're not supposed to and recyclers are not supposed to take cats from a dismantler that's non-licensed and stuff, but people still steal these off of there because there is platinum and precious metals on the inside. That's what makes them work. So, all right. So I wanted to finish up with a little bit of exhaust system stuff. Okay. Um, here is your exhaust manifold. Again, we can see our oxygen sensor that's in front of the cat. We can also see, oh, look, there's another leaky valve cover. That, that, that could be a nice little upsell job. Easy to get to alternator, though. That's nice. Um, there's that catalytic converter. There's the muffler. Um, looks like the, here's the wire come for that rear sensor. And of course, because the engine moves, because the engine moves, the exhaust system also moves back and forth. And so that's why it's hung on rubber mounts to allow that movement of the engine in relation to the body of the car. Okay. Sometimes I'll find these and the rubber mounts are broken and then, you know, the, the exhaust is rattling on the body of the car. So those are all things I look at when I'm underneath the car. All right. Muffler. Back side of the car. Pretty straightforward. All right. So. Oops. So we made it through my undercar presentation. And I'm running out of liquids here, but we're we're doing pretty good as far as time. So um, you know, th there's lots of stuff to look at underneath the car. I remember early on when I was just you know starting to work on cars. You know, I, I would get a car up on jack stands and I'd roll underneath there with the creeper and I would probably spend an hour just looking around at stuff and how's, how are things hooked together? And, you know, I'm looking for leaks. I'm looking for stuff that's loose, uh, you know, and you can, you can diagnose a lot of problems with a good, thorough visual inspection. All right, so I'm gonna change my screen share uh, back to the internet and I told you guys that um, we would talk about getting your car up on jack stands. And actually, um, a few uh, weeks ago, Justin and uh, Cheryl uh, covered some information on that, right? Um, so I'm going to click this video cl clip 
but I'm going to put the guy on on mute here. Oh, Ma Mazda, by the way, they they just got consumer reports. Um, this guy's a little bit crazy, but he's got some good information. He's like the the madman scientist guy. Um, anyways, Mazda just got the uh, support of consumer reports for uh, highest quality car manufacturer again. So it's kind of kind of neat. Um, so he's got a couple of floor jacks here and he's talking about the body seams underneath the car. So what the what the madman's talking about here is there's a seam, right? There's this is a car, it does not have a frame like a truck, but the way the body is pinched together, the metals fold in a way and it creates a nice seam along the bottom side of the car, okay? So when we lift the car, we can lift it by the body seam. Um, it's definitely a good spot if you're putting it on a, on a two post lift or something. But if you're using a floor jack and you were only lifting from one spot, that's a lot of pressure on one little point. So let me play this thing. And let's look at that body seam. There it is. So you can see that that seam's not real big. Now that little divot right there is for the little tiny floor jack that comes with the car for changing an emergency spare tire. You'll notice that there is a little arrow right here to show you like where that little jack clips in there. Um, you could put your floor jack right there, but you have to be careful because sometimes your floor jack, if it's at an angle, it will just fold that seam right over there. So what I usually like to do is all jack underneath like the lower control arms, the suspension is bolted to the wheels. And of course that supports the car. I'll put my floor jack under the suspension and then I'll, I'll put the jack stands on the body seams. So I don't fold the seams over. Let's see what the madman does. It's always talking about his floor jacks. You want a floor jack that's rated for the vehicle that you're going to be testing. So let me pause that. Oop, get out of there. So you notice that this floor jack here is rated at two tons, right? So, you know, that would work for, for most vehicles, even most your pickup trucks. But let's say I had a little light duty one ton jack. That's not going to lift up your big, you know, huge suburban. It's just not a strong enough jack. Now, the, the other mistake I see people make a lot is they, they just work on the car. They get underneath it, and it's just being supported by one of these jacks because this looks bigger and heavier duty than this jack stand, right? But this thing's hydraulic, and it could develop a leak. I mean, it, it, could, it could go down at any moment. This is safer. So you never work on a car just on the floor jack. You can work underneath it when it's on some jack stands and properly secured. Okay. Well, let's keep going. He's got a couple different floor jacks there. He's going to try to position the jacks. Now he's talking about the jack stands. So he's going right under the body seam. Ah, dang guy. And you know, like he's got a pretty good floor jack there. The, it's a front engine, front wheel drive car. He's lifting the rear of the car. You know, it can handle it. You do have to be careful though, that you don't fold over those body seams if you're lifting it from the seams. Here's the mistake I see a lot of people make is they wanna work on the car right now and it's only being supported by the jack. Make sure you get it on some jack stands before you get underneath there. Now, I didn't see his jack stands. He's making me nervous. Now he's going back down. Now, oh, there we go. There he's, there he's got a jack stand underneath it. 
kind of in a weird spot. So let me pause this right there. So I would do it a little different, not that one way is necessarily better than the other, but I would put my jack stands underneath the body seam. So I'd have like one jack stand here, another jack stand back there, one there, one up there. And when I lifted the car, I would lift it by the front suspension right there, put the jack stand there, lift the front suspension over here, put the jack stand there, R lift the rear suspension. I might even put my floor jack right here, lift up the rear of the car in unison, and then put a jack stand on each side. So gosh, this is making me want to make my own video because I'm not real happy with the madman's video here. So um, again, don't work on a car with it just up on jack stands all, or uh, just up on floor jacks. Always make sure it's on jack stands before you work on it. Um, and make sure those jack stands are properly set up, that you're on a level surface, um, that type of thing. All right. So let me, let me get out of this guy's video here. Okay. And we'll clear out those drawings and get that out of the way. And I'm going to grab a picture of some car ramps. There we go. Look at that. All kinds of car ramps. All right. So these are super nice for like, let's say you just, you just got to get the car up on something so you can do an oil change or something. They work pretty good for that. You got to make sure you don't drive up and off the ramp. That turns into a nightmare. So that, you know, that part's a little sketchy. Um, the metal ones tend to get pushed forward. Uh, so, you know, they might be a little stronger. I actually like the plastic ones as long as they have a good rating. So see how this is 12,000 pounds GVW gross vehicle weight rating. That's a good one. Uh, you got to watch some of these ones that are real cheap to make sure that they have the rating that you want. Most of the time, like you're not going to be able to lift like a real heavy pickup truck on some ramps. But if it's your little Honda, even like a little RAV4 or something, you could you could use some ramps for that. Now, speaking of uh, ramps, though. One of the things that um, I want you guys to be aware of is that, uh, hey, if I'm using these ramps, let me get my drawing tool going. You know, make sure that if here is, oops, here's my black ramps right here. And here is my car. That if I'm gonna use these things, Not the most aerodynamic car, but I got to be certain that my car is not going to roll down off the ramps and squash me, right? So I want to put a good wheel chalk behind the rear wheels. I want to, you know, put the brake on, put the car in park. I actually know one of our instructors, his good friend that lives lived right down the street from him. The guy was a master tech from General Motors. He's doing a side job in his driveway. He takes out that drive shaft that we uh, looked at earlier, right? The shaft that goes between the transmission and the rear differential. Well, the car was in park. He takes out the drive shaft. Well, now it's like it's not in park anymore. It's like you put it in neutral. And he didn't have wheel chocks in here. And the thing just rolled back and it squashed him and killed him. So when you're using ramps, but anytime you're using floor jacks or anything like that, make sure the wheels are chocked and the car can't roll away on you. Be very, very cautious if you're working on anything that's any type of an incline. And then, of course, be concerned, too, if you're working on any type of loose surface because um, you don't want a jack stand sinking into the dirt and causing the car to fail. I mean, remember that that vehicle, this is two, three, four thousand pounds or more of stored energy that gravity wants to take to the ground. So don't get underneath it unless you're 100 percent sure that you have it really secured. And whenever I get it on jack stands or ramps. I always come over here and I shake the vehicle and make sure that this thing's not going anywhere. 
because I'd rather it fall off of the, the ramps and stuff while I'm not underneath the car than when I'm underneath it, okay? Um, the other thing I do is, you know, I'll make sure the keys are out of the car. I'll put some stuff, I'll block, block the area. The last thing I want to do is be underneath the car and a family member or friend gets in it to start it up or do something silly. Um, and that causes a safety issue. So whenever you're getting underneath the car, you really have to be on your game and think it through. I've seen lots of people hurt by doing silly things. In fact, I just did something silly the other day. I had a car and I was working not on a nice, good surface. I was working out in the backyard, moving stuff around and kind of short gunning some stuff. And instead of doing stuff like I should with jack stands and stuff, because I was in the dirt, I said, you know what? I put it on a block and guess what? That block sunk in the ground a little bit and it just got in such a uh, unique angle that when I kind of shook the car, boom, it broke the block and then it fell off the, you know, broke right through the block and fell into the dirt. So um, a lot of times you'll see people that, oh, they got it up on blocks, right? Somebody stole my wheels or something. Um, these really aren't the best. They're not as good as a jack stand. What I should have done is maybe got a couple sheets of plywood on the ground to disperse the weight and then set up my jack stand. I'm trying to draw a jack stand. My jack stand here to uh, properly secure the vehicle instead of using the cinder block. So anyways, um, always be very, very cautious and think things through when you're going to get underneath the vehicle. It's a ton of potential uh, energy that is there. It's a whole purpose in life. It seems like it wants to squash it. So, all right. Um, under car inspections, man, you, you it, once you get the car safely and safe and secured, and you can get underneath it, man, you can see a lot of stuff. Um, and there really are some neat options these days, by the way, for you guys that are, um, you know, like do it yourselfers. I mean, you can even get um, some cool lifts. I'm going to throw up a few. So these things are pretty cool. It lifts, you know, it lifts it up to, um, uh, working height like you would on floor jacks and stands, but it lifts it up evenly. This thing looks really cool. It doesn't lift it all the way up. It's not as good as like a real full size lift, but it's somewhat portable. You do have to put some anchors in the ground and actually bolt it to your floor, but you can then unscrew the bolts and move it out to the side. Um, so that thing's pretty cool. Um, and so there's, there's just more and more neat options for, uh, you know, getting your car up. Um, uh, I don't know the name of this one. I just, oh, there it is. This thing looks pretty cool as well, where you can lift the car and tilt it. So, um, anyways. That thing's pretty cool looking. Um, so uh, questions on some of this stuff. Remember what we have for you guys to do this week is I would follow along with Leo on the under vehicle inspection. If you have the facilities at home and you wanted to get underneath the, your car, you could, but otherwise you could just follow along with Leo and kind of go through it. Um, you know, you even don't necessarily have to get underneath your car to test a lot of things. Like if you could, you know, just take off one wheel and look at one wheel area at a time, you could look at your, your, your brake assembly, your strut, you can do a quick CV joint inspection. Um, you can test your shocks by shaking the car. And what I like to do is go to each corner and push on it real hard with all my body weight, give it a good jounce test. And the car should push down under my weight, spring back up, and then stabilize out. 
if I push down on it real hard and the car keeps whoom, whoom, oscillating back and forth, that's a sign that I have worn shock absorbers. So there's a lot of stuff you can do even without getting all the way underneath your vehicle. So you might do a mix of the videos and a mix of what you can see on your own car um, to get you an idea of what's what's um, what's going on with your vehicle. So that's that's essentially where we're what we're on right now. I need to add some stuff. I'll be working on stuff throughout the throughout the week um, because where we're going to go next is kind of related to the undercar theme, and that is tires and wheels. And then we're going to be moving into brake inspections. And so I've shot some other videos and we'll get going on that stuff as well. Okay. Um, questions on any of the stuff besides the safety test. I've not forgotten. Uh, we're going to, we're going to jump into that. Um, but you know, as far as tonight's material, any other questions related to undercar inspections, I am happy to answer, answer what questions you might have. Um, before we pause the recording. Go ahead. Uh, um, so I had a question. I, I kind of got here a little late. I had a yeah. little uh, bit of a hiccup, but uh, yeah. I don't know if you went over the EGR system. I don't know if I've, I... Uh, I didn't, but we certainly out. we certainly can. Um, so let's uh, let's just grab a, uh, a Google tab here. Sure. Okay, so uh, yeah, I've been having exhaust gas recirculation valve, okay? And it's mm -hmm. one of your emission control devices. And uh, depending upon the car, it, it's going to look maybe something like this or like that. But the, the and here, there's a linear EGR valve off of a GM car. There's a, looks like a Toyota one. The idea with an EGR valve is this. And you can see the Achilles heel of these things is the passages on the insides get all clogged up and nastied up. What does the valve do? Well, it um, is connected to your exhaust system and it takes exhaust gases that would normally just go out your tailpipe and it routes them around back to your intake manifold. So, let's see if I can find a good picture where maybe you can see the whole manifold. Would something like this, like if it were to fail, would it cause like a, a misfire? Like just like how kind of a... It can. Um, okay, so... This is probably a pretty decent image that I can draw on. Um, okay, what you can't see here is that there's a pipe that goes down that connects to the exhaust system. And then this valve is bolted to the intake manifold. So what happens is the exhaust gas will come up, you know, through the pipe when the vacuum line that's disconnected right here, but when the vacuum line says, hey, I want the EGR valve to turn on, he puts some vacuum on here, the valve opens up, and that lets exhaust gases then come up that tube and into your intake manifold to lower the NOx emissions inside the car, right? Well, because you have exa exhaust gases flowing through there over time, that's why you get carbon buildup and it gets all clogged up. Well, you mentioned a misfire. If you have an EGR valve that is too aggressive, so what I mean is that um, you don't want your EGR valve on at low speeds or at idle, okay? Because if he starts dumping a bunch of exhaust gas, gas um, into your intake manifold, that is going to displace the fuel and oxygen that's in there, and it's going to run poorly. So if the EGR valve is either coming on not when it, when it shouldn't, that could cause a misfire, or if he's just coming on too strong, he's dumping too much exhaust gas, inside the inside the engine that will again dilute the air fuel mixture and it can make like a random misfire and so the easiest way to tell if hey maybe my egr valve is is a little bit overactive and that's causing my random misfire or my hesitation is i would disconnect this vacuum line right here and i plug it and then i go drive the car and see if my problem went away or not now you might have an engine where now, now it doesn't misfire, but now the engine pings because it's designed to have that certain amount of EGR flow. So, um, so it can cause uh, like a random misfire. That's not as common. The most common thing that happens with EGR valves is um, that the passages get all clogged up 
and then it's not flowing enough exhaust gas and now it fails smog test either by a check engine light being on or failing out the tailpipe okay but uh, i have had that case where the egr was a little bit overactive especially on cars like toyotas or chryslers that use a egr back pressure transducer um anyways so yep there you go egr valves uh all kinds of different styles um they could be on a turbocharged car a naturally aspirated car um for a while they went away from our cars and now we're seeing them be put back on cars so um yeah just so something to deal with there so hopefully did that answer your question yeah, yeah. that generally answered my question yeah i mean there's all kinds like this this one's computer controlled so it's not using a vacuum line it's a linear egr valve um there's solenoid operated ones all kinds of different stuff um the ones that are vacuum controlled like This one right here, like if this thing leaks vacuum, it will not work like it should. So that's one problem. Uh, sometimes the electric ones, like the little electric motor gets stuck in here, or sometimes it gets so much carbon in there that it's stuck in the, the valve. You can see right here, the valve couldn't move back and forth because it's all gummed up, right? So those are all like kind of common complaints with EGR valves, okay? Good question. Any other uh, like technical questions like that? That stuff's good. That's that's what I want to hear. Um, remember, it, it, you know, if it, I don't know everything, so if you stump me, we'll just that gives us something to look up and we'll figure it out. And that's part of the fun of working on cars is there's always no matter how much you know, there is always going to be more stuff that you don't know. There's always new technology, new problems, all kinds of stuff. And and so as an auto person. Um, as a technician, you're constantly learning, and that's you know one of the things that keeps keeps the job exciting. So, um, okay, any other questions besides SP2 safety test stuff? All right, so I'll check the chat, but that looks pretty good. Um, so uh, with that, thank you for being with me tonight. Um, again, we're working through week five undercar inspections. And then after that, where we'll be going is into tires and wheels and brakes, which I'm really excited about. Um, you know, tires are arguably the most important part of your car because they're what connects you to the road, right? Um, so I thank you guys for being with me tonight. What I'm going to do is I'm going to turn off the recording and then I'm going to help out uh, Jacob and anybody else who's having problems with their safety test but I don't need to record all that stuff just in case I have to enter in their passwords and stuff. Okay. All right. So the rest of you guys, if you're okay on your safety tests, you guys can go for those of you who need some technical assistance, you guys stay on the line. And again, thank you be for being with me uh, tonight. All right.